On today's World Inside, a chance for China and the U.S. to set the record straight at the Munich Security Conference. What will it take for the world's top economies to mend relations toward easing rising tensions? Absolutely no reason to believe that this uh, anti-China containment strategy will abate or even plateau uh, anytime soon. And here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The 59th Munich Security Conference wrapped up last weekend with the mission to address the world's most pressing security concerns. On the sidelines of the event, Wang Yi, director of the Office of Foreign Affairs Commission of the CPC Central Committee, had an unofficial meeting with U.S. Secretaries of State, Antony Blinken, during which the two parties discussed the balloon incident. This is the second high-level engagement between China and the U.S. since the two presidents met during the G20 merely three months ago. Yet, the China-U.S. relationship is not thriving and booming as the world expected since then. How to bring China-U.S. ties back on track? Is there still hope? For more, let's loop in our panelists. In Washington, D.C., Surab Gupta, Senior Asia-Pacific International Relations Policy Specialist with the Institute for China-American Studies. In Shanghai, Joseph Gregory Mahoney, Professor of Politics with East China Normal University. Also in Shanghai, Shen Ding Li, Professor with the Institute of International Studies of Fudan University. Gentlemen, welcome to the program. Over the weekend, the meeting between Secretary Blinken and China's uh, uh, State Councillor Wang Yi certainly has uh, occupied the headlines of global media. So, Professor Shen, very briefly start from you. What do you think of the results of the discussion regarding the balloon incident or the balloon drama? Well, I think uh, the purpose is to reset China-U.S. relationship uh, because the recent thing has been derailed uh, uh, out of the a balloon shock. So the two leaders of the, of the countries, uh, they want to uh, turn over the page and uh, move on the relationship to uh, lots of regional and global uh, st uh, uh, strategic issues. But from the readout uh, of both sides, it seems uh, the balloon thing has occupied quite a few paragraphs. Uh, yes. Uh, they need to show each other's position. I think each other understand other's position, but in order to uh, speak to their own audience domestically, uh, they have to uh, uh, pretend to defend their position. But I think this is a very important exchange in order to negotiate a way uh, to bring the relationship mm -hmm. out of the trap of the balloon uh, uh, shock. All right. Professor uh, Mahoney, please. Well, you know, I don't think the balloon incident is the cause of tensions. I think rather it was exploited uh, deliberately by the United States in order to accommodate uh, American desires for increased tensions. Um, I think the path, the, the, it's very clear the U.S. is on a path of increased provocations. We know that we'll have more directed towards Taiwan soon. Um, and if we look back, you know, to the waning days of the Obama administration, uh, they have accumulated step by step through the Trump administration and, and really accelerated during the Biden administration, growing more and more intense. There's absolutely no reason to believe that this uh, anti-China containment strategy will abate or even plateau uh, anytime soon. Uh, rather, almost every indication we have in terms of what the U.S. is doing and continues to do against mm. China um, is that it will increase um, and that the, the U.S. will continue uh, to do so until uh, it is no longer uh, feeling threatened by China, uh, yeah. until it's either knock China back far enough or knock China down, or, or the U.S. gets its own house in order and no longer feels vulnerable due to its own inability to, to govern itself. Do you think, Professor Mahoney, that the Chinese reaction so far, including from State Councilor Wang Yi, 
have spoken clearly to the U.S. Uh, quote unquote provocation, as you believed, against China? I think China has been very, very clear. I think that, that China and, and, and a number of people keep looking very optimistically towards the United States, keep, keep communicating clearly, keep saying this is what we expect. Um, but increasingly, uh, you know, we, we see that the U.S. is on this path and, mm. and ignores China, um, uh, characterizes things in the worst possible way, demonizes China, um, and really is locked in this uh, global media war uh, that aims to uh, poison any positive China message uh, around the world uh, as an effort to try to sustain U.S. hegemony and power. Mm -hmm. Dr. Gupta, from your perspective, I'm sure you read the more American press coverage than all of us uh, based in China, but uh, inside the Beltway, what exactly is the sense regarding the balloon incident? In other, way, in other words, what is your take from the readouts and also the attitudes followed by the meeting? Uh, with regard to the meeting, what came out, stood out for me, was the agreement on both sides to disagree on with regard to actions related to the balloon. Uh, I think what one of the things I would do is to hark back to the Anchorage meeting. Uh, Wang Yi and Mr. Blinken were present, and at that meeting, they were doing their politics and speaking to their home to home turf, and so they were putting forth very clear positions which were in disagreement with each other. And it took a long while for the two countries to try to create some sort of a modus operandi to move forward, a modus vivendi. What one will see from this balloon meeting, and that's why from this Munich meeting, and it's a sharp contrast with Anchorage, is how much, how soon they will be able to move beyond and try to kind of create, to, to, to resurrect ties and have some sort of better communication and restart the working groups. But I think it's also important that the two sides laid out their positions clearly out here. And I think both sides wanted to place this on the record so that there's clarity and, uh, on intentions on both sides if ever such an event were to occur. Okay. Professor Shen, uh, your thoughts on the so-called precedent setting, is it? Uh, I think uh, uh, if we can take any the good things from this incident, that is, both China and U.S. need to respect each other's uh, sovereignty. Uh, sure, the balloon has uh, entered the U.S. territorial space. Uh, China U.S. difference is whether this is truly uh, unintentional and uh, it is truly for civilian use. That uh, the two countries should find a way how to avoid the recurrence of this by negotiating uh, the bilateral code, mm. for instance. As far as I know, uh, Professor, we do not have international rules or clear rules regarding these kind of balloon thing. So um, that's, that's what I know so far. Correct me if yes. I'm wrong. Yes. Then China U.S. need to work out uh, the bilateral code of conduct. When China and U.S. have no confidence, no trust, every party need to do uttermost to uh, protect the trust by uh, have, having cooperative inspection, monitoring. Mm. This is what uh, Chinese balloon in the future need to do. And mm. this is also for the U.S. future balloon, uh, which claim to be out of control and uh, is uh, used for civilian purpose. U.S. balloon should land in China and should notify China when they are about to enter China. And China and U.S. need to make their bilateral code to become a guideline of a future international uh, treaty. China and U.S. need to work out their uh, future law, how to handle a uh, future incident. But in the meantime, uh, U.S. need to uh, seriously respect China's uh, concern that America has no right to meddle in China's Taiwan issue, domestic uh, issue. I think Professor Shen is making a very important point, and that point is, you know, in 20, in, during the second Obama administration, the U.S. and China managed to create confidence-building measures. These were written agreements, codes, with regard to air and air, air, air-to-air -air account encounters and maritime encounters. And what we now need is a new code 
with regard to unmanned vessel encounters because we might have UUVs in the waters and we have balloons in near space and there needs to be a code. Professor Mahoney, from my, pers from, from my understanding, it seems that you are saying these two gentlemen are going to nowhere. It seems that you're suggesting that, you know, this incident is just one of those incidents that one party takes advantage of against the other party, and whether it's the balloon or a, a, a flying, another flying object or, or on, the, on the water or whatever, it's only being used as a way to pro provoke the other party and to have a rhetoric war against the other party. Is that what you're trying to say? What about the argument from the both gentlemen? Is it going to be useful? Well, first of all, I agree with both of them that, that there are ways, constructive ways, that we can uh, prevent these types of problems from happening again. But I don't really think that that's uh, the American intention at this point. You know, the problem uh, with the American balloon story is that there were so many uh, inconsistencies from the start, and these are still mounting. Uh, the U.S. first said it appeared suddenly over Canadian and then U.S. airspace, then later said they'd been tracking it since what they, uh, since, uh, uh, what they described as its departure from Hainan. The U.S. said the balloon could maneuver and change course and that it was doing so deliberately in the U.S. for espionage reasons, but then later said it was only intended to fly over Hawaii and Guam but was blown off course. The U.S. said it was a, a threat uh, to U.S. security. Uh, but later said it wasn't necessary to shoot it down until it left U.S. airspace because it was never really a threat. The U.S. said it couldn't shoot it down until it reached the ocean because falling debris might hurt people. But in fact, the balloon was over very large and uninhabited re uh, areas for most of the time uh, that the U.S. claims to have been tracking it. Now, if the balloon was malfunctioning uh, and as large as the U.S. claims, uh, then wasn't it more of a threat of falling from the sky and perhaps hurting people below? And shouldn't it have been shot down while it was still over Canada, as mm -hmm. the U.S. did to other unidentified objects, including one in Canadian airspace? But if it was really uh, never a threat, then why was it necessary to shoot it down, uh, above all, once it reached the ocean? Now, this is only a partial list of the inconsistencies. Now, I don't think the Biden administration is deliberately trying to leave the door open for dialogue by equivocating now on the balloon story. Uh, or rather, I think the administration uh, has achieved its objectives of derailing uh, the Blinken visit to Beijing and by inducing more fear of China in the U.S. ahead of uh, Biden's uh, State of the Union speech, where he mentioned uh, uh, this incident and, and mentioned China uh, explicitly by name more than any other country, including more than he mentioned the U.S. Mm -hmm. And I think he certainly achieved the goal of creating a global headline. We saw it all over the world, dominating uh, the BBC, Al Jazeera, CGTN, all the American networks um, in ways that harmed uh, China's international reputation. And we know that this issue was raised again in Brussels during the NATO meeting uh, in order to uh, once again try to push NATO uh, to view China as a threat and to reposition accordingly. Let me move on to another important issue, the Russian-Ukraine conflict. Now, uh, Professor Shen, Chinese State Councilor Wang Yi, invited a meeting with the Foreign Minister of Ukraine on the sideline of the Munich Security Conference. And uh, that was also uh, coincides with the, what Chinese consider as certainly unfounded accusations from Secretary Blinken about China's, uh, uh, with, uh, China's relations with Russia regarding the conflict. Um, so what is your understanding of how China is articulating uh, a conspiracy, it seems, uh, from Washington against China on the most sensitive and crucial issues uh, of the world today, which is the Russian-Ukraine conflict? and certainly an issue dear to the hearts of the Europeans. Uh, China would uh, take action to indicate you are wrong. Uh, that's not the truth. See, we are engaging more intensely and actively, pro proactively with Ukraine. So on this occasion, uh, Mr. Wang Yi would meet with uh, Ukraine foreign minister and probably on other occasion, there are many other high-level meetings uh, between the two countries would happen. Uh, first and foremost, Chinese president would uh, publish, would unveil his peace plan 
uh, that may uh, take into consideration of the legitimate security concern of each uh, of them, Ukraine and uh, Russia. Mm. So China would uh, be fair, but and would table a position for every party to consider. Following that, China may take more uh, position to, uh, uh, to, to say, we are responsible. We do not only understand Russia, we also try to understand Ukraine better. Okay. On the sideline of the concluded the Munich Security Conference, Dr. Gupta, we heard uh, uh, some of the members of uh, Chinese delegations and members of Chinese academic circle traveling there suggesting the Ukraine war, the Russian-Ukraine conflict, has nothing to do with China. Why is the U.S. trying to drag China into this issue and also try to accuse China in front of the U.S. allies about China playing, quote-unquote, a role there? Uh, Dr. Gupta. Exactly. What is behind this is because the, those folks, and that includes the administration, would love to see the world divided into blocks between a dem, dem, de, democratic bloc and an authoritarian bloc, lump President Xi with President Putin, that, you know, a single, single source or single point of failure yeah. in one man can be, a, 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 can, can cause un, un, untold tragedy and try to frame it in that sort of Cold War mindset that we are fated to compete even though we did not want to compete when frankly the, the truth is, the, is, is exactly the opposite. And that's why this effort to link China to Russia, well, I would say India's actions have been identical to China, if not even it's purchased more oil and has been more supportive of mm -hmm. Russia. And yet India has been folded into the Western bloc, the EU, uh, von der Leyen came to India and, and said, let's right. restart the trade and investment dialogue. And, and so it's this trying to frame and reshape international order into democracies versus autocracies, because the U.S. is much more comfortable in that sort of we are locked in a, into conflict. We are locked in a Cold War style. And then let's transact and try to keep it not get out of control, but let's let's compete in that Cold War fashion. And that is the reason China has been lumped together with Russia in as they're trying to lump it together and try to frame the world, uh, the international relations in that in that perspective. Professor Mahoney, what, please. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to I agree substantially with, with Professor Gupta, but I'd, I'd like to add very uh, two very direct reasons. First, th uh, this conflict in Ukraine uh, has forced the United States to invest heavily in NATO, and this was um, uh, something that uh, certainly the Trump administration didn't want to do, but uh, Biden has taken this as an opportunity to, uh, to re-extend uh, U.S. hegemony in Europe and extend NATO uh, far beyond what it, what it, what it was uh, previously. Um, but in doing so, it has uh, diverted money and attention that it would be instead more directly spending in its efforts uh, uh, against China directly. So I think the, the, the desire here is, OK, we have to invest all this money and all this effort into rebuilding and extending NATO. Wouldn't it therefore be great if we could in part blame China for the conflict in Ukraine? And this would provide some compelling reason uh, for NATO uh, to view China as uh, an enemy as well and then redirect NATO uh, against China specifically. And I think that this is certainly something uh, this type of analysis is borne out mm. uh, in part uh, by the NATO General Secretary coming to South Korea, coming to Japan, and uh, and uh, in tandem with, you know, the 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 other developments that we've seen, uh, right. uh, uh, AUKUS and and um, uh, the new security uh, relationship between the UK and uh, Japan. Uh, it's 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 that's the the broader uh, goal, I think, and to and to sort of blame China for the 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 danger in Ukraine. Um, therefore, would provide some sort of logic for extending NATO's uh, mandate. Mm. Professor Shen, on the Taiwan question, uh, and that has been, uh, the stance of China has been reiterated once and again. And according to the U.S. readout, there also seems to be accommodating uh, comments, yet, of course, Words are one thing, actions are the other. We understand very well since uh, China-U.S. interactions in recent years. So, Professor Chen, your take. Uh, Mr. Wang Yi has 
indicated is that uh, President uh, Xi would soon uh, publish his uh, uh, outline of global security initiative. And that uh, may create some framework for many countries uh, to uh, uh, discuss and probably to find a common ground. And he also said that China is strongly against the U.S. meddling of the Taiwan issue, and uh, we condemn this. And he also said that the uh, Chinese side may uh, propose some peace proposal on the question of Ukraine. So these are all uh, important points that Mr. Wang Yi has raised uh, in Munich. Mm. On the issue of Taiwan, uh, Dr. Gupta, what you have noticed from the wording uh, in the U.S. readout? When we come to the Taiwan issue, the moral high ground uh, resides on, on, on the Chinese side. And therefore, the Chinese readout says that, yes, if you suggest that you follow uh, the one China principle and you do not support Taiwan's independence, then show us that you do not support Taiwan's independence by your actions. And this is very appropriate because right now, this weekend, as we are speaking, the Taiwanese foreign minister and the national security advisor are in Virginia to speak with AIT people. They have that special channel that they have. And so it's a very appropriate moment while the U.S. here is defensive, like, oh, we, it's our one China policy and we will follow it and blah, blah, blah. So let's go to Professor Mahoney on that, on the issue of Taiwan. How do you read from both sides' attitude, official ones, of course, uh, out of the meeting? I don't think, uh, after all of these years, that the United States has ever viewed uh, the Chinese government in Beijing as legitimate. I don't think they really respect the one China policy. And above all, I think they are playing for time in trying to uh, um, um, uh, outflank uh, China as China is rising and as the U.S. is declining. I think they're trying to um, uh, push others down, including Europe, mm -hmm. uh, through this conflict, including uh, Russia, and now with this anti-China uh, uh, containment policy. Uh, and I think that the goal is just try to push every down, uh, every, everyone else down faster than the U.S. itself declines. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it will work in the end, um, mm -hmm. but I, I am fearful, uh, above all, that the U.S. is trying to use Taiwan as a point of leverage in this grander scheme of, of pushing China back. Mm. Professor Shen, on the Taiwan issue. Well, I think uh, uh, double standards are plentiful. Uh, I noticed that the Secretary Blinken, in his read out, uh, pointed out uh, the US has no change in its one China policy. That's wrong. US keeps changing America's version of one China policy every day. And that one China policy has been vastly different from uh, mainly the China's one China uh, principle. Uh, mainly China considers that Taiwan is our, a part of China. Uh, Taiwan matter is of the nature of China's sovereignty. Uh, we want to uh, attain reunification, the final reintegration in a peaceful manner, uh, but we cannot relinquish it. Uh, any other uh, 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 formats that can lead to our eventual reunification. And uh, out, out of all, this is of China's sovereignty. Just like the U.S. seems to treasure its own territorial space, China uh, uh, dearly treasure its sovereignty, yeah. and America has made all efforts to stop China. That made uh, me to think America has such a ridiculous uh, double and even multiple standards. With the latest interaction between Chinese State Councilor and the U.S. Secretary of State on the sidelines of the Munich Security Conference, how much do we see that there are at least the minor steps walked already toward those goals? You know, I think that the, the disrupted Blinken meeting to Beijing um, uh, really set things back, and then the balloon set things back. We know that uh, the House uh, uh, Speaker is likely to visit Taiwan. That will set things back. So I'm concerned that any little positive steps that we might see will take two or three steps backward again. I think that's the trend, and I think it'll certainly continue over the next two years as we approach the U.S. Uh, presidential election. Dr. Gupta. 
Uh, well, I'd say I'm encouraged by the fact that it is the U.S. side which sought the meeting. The proof will be in proof of the pudding will be in its eating, and we'll see in the months ahead whether this has been the restart of a, of a dialogue of the various working groups and dialogue channels. I think it will be the case. And we have to remember, there's a big debt ceiling issue coming up in this country mid-year, and China is a huge holder of treasuries. And therefore, uh, the U.S. does not want a real rupture or a fissure, particularly in financial markets. But we we'll have to see. And my hope is, but and my expectation also okay. is, that this will be a restart of the dialogue mechanisms. Professor Shen, we see some... Uh... Uh, certainly very close link between China and the United States in, in certain areas. However, we also see uh, quite clear conflicts, at least of words, and sometimes even of actions in the other. How do you see where we are as a result of the latest meeting? I think uh, the two presidents may have a telephone conversation uh, to finally pave the way that uh, Blinken will come to China. And then, uh, the two countries would implement the two presidents uh, used to agree in Indonesia at the last G20. They would work on how to control the damage uh, over the Taiwan challenge. And they would work on how to uh, make uh, the Ukraine issue uh, less confrontational. And they would work on uh, North Korea for its uh, uh, repetitive uh, long-range missile uh, launch. They would work on okay. uh, global production chain, how to uh, not to make this to disrupt each other's economy and global economic stability, and et cetera, et cetera. So lots of good things are uh, waiting to be discussed. But uh, uh, first and foremost, they would also probably set up a balloon uh, a working group, how to avoid the repetition of such a very unfortunate uh, 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 incident. All right. We hope the real topics and the real focus will not be hijacked by either fake accusations or lack of communications or intentional uh, rhetorics against the other. Thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us. Dr. Gupta, Professor Mahoney, Professor Shen, appreciate it. And that's all the time we have for today. If you'd like to know more, search World Insight or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. I'm Tian Wei. On behalf of the team, thanks for being with us.